So my CPD, um, my group presentation uh, for my 2018 submission for my CPD is about how we can more effectively rehabilitate our patients. Um, I think, well, I come to a conclusion a long time ago that I think that the training for uh, rehabilitation of our patients um, is quite uh, is, is underwhelming or it's not it's not adequate um, to fully rehabilitate our patients based on our training at the BSO. Um, now, what I've done in my research uh, and my development of uh, my formula to rehabilitate uh, my patients is I've combined pain science uh, with motivational interviewing uh, and strength and conditioning mainly to construct a rehabilitation plan which is more effective for our patients. I've shown it to be more effective um, in our clinic. We can see that statistically um, our patients are more likely to come back because they can see an end goal in sight. They know exactly what the process is for the longevity of their rehab in comparison to just coming to an appointment every week hoping that the pain is going to reduce. As well as that the satisfaction, rate of satisfaction increase, we have a rate of satisfaction which is, uh, has increased beyond 95% uh, high of our customers are now highly satisfied with the service that we're delivering and um, about 30% of our osteopathic patients said that one thing that they highly valued was the programs that we set them for rehabilitation. So the question um, is why is this needed? So when we look at um, rehabilitation um, or when we look at chronic pain especially chronic pain is uh, very uh, is very much characterized by a sense of hopelessness uh, of a higher center and lower center facilitation so it's not just facilitation at spinal cord level um, where you've got involvement of the wide dynamic range neurons but you've also got involvement of the um, homunculus in the brain and sensory somatocortex but then as well as that um, psychologically uh, that person might not have a, a positive association with what they can do, um, and and or what what they can do with their injury, uh, and how they can function with their injury. So it all starts with first of all the end goal. The end goal. What does that patient want from coming to us for their services? And this it will be put in last at the end of the rehabilitation plan because that's what we're aiming for. But it's the first question that we ask. So for example, the patient might say that I want to play with my kids again, and it's our responsibility to take. Um, their goal outside of the treatment room and have a treatment, a, new, a quantifiable treatment outcome. So for example, if they want to pick up their child again, it means that they should therefore be able to do a goblet squat with say 10 kilos for 10 reps. If we can say that right at the end of the rehabilitation, they can do a goblet squat uh, with 10 kilos for 10 reps, then it means that we know that they can safely pick up their child again. And this goes, this is input directly into phase three of the rehabilitation notes that are provided to you. Phase three, i.e. the state to discharge. So this will be that the patient can lift uh, 10 kilos for three sets of 10 in a goblet squat. Then we know that they can play with their kids pain free. It could be that we want them to be able to hold a plank position for at least 20 seconds so they can replicate the spinal load um, from a plank to the same as them picking up their other compressive load of a plank to then pick up their child. Um, or it could be that we need them to be able to do, for example, a freestanding lunge pain-free. If we can do that, then we know that we could discharge them because they've reached the end of the rehab plan and they can go through a load in a control setting, which is um, replicable of an uncontrolled, uncontrolled setting, which is them outside of the treatment room. So then our goal is to um, also tell the patient exactly how many treatments they think we think that they'll need. And the reason why this is important is because um, it puts us in a center of trust because we've already solidified, we've already said that it's going to probably take this amount of treatments, no more um, and no less. But also, as well as that, it stops any nasty, expect, un uh, nasty um, unexpected um, visits from the patient where they're constantly concerned about how much they're paying out or how often they're going to have to come visit or how long it's going to take for them to recover. So it creates um, more of a, a, a relationship of trust between us and the patient. Now, once again, it's important to state your patient goals, i.e. what do they want from this process, because our ideal of a healthy spine is not going to be the same as our patient's ideal of a healthy spine, so we need to dictate that. Now, what we need to do first off is we need to take that patient's end goal, for example, I want to be able to pick up my kids pain-free, and then we need to backwards engineer that. So we go from what is hardest, picking up their kid, to what is second hardest, might be not picking up a kid, but doing a squat, what is uh, not as difficult as that, it could be doing a box squat, for example, and you backwards engineer from there. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to put uh, that patient's pain 
um, in their control. If we can put that patient's pain in their control, then the facilitation or the hypersensitization or even the, the, the adenia around the area will reduce. And the reason why is, is that, uh, like Laura Mosley said, pain is an alarm system or pain is, is not a rational experience. Pain is very is more closely linked to that patient's perception of danger. And the more that we can, the danger than any structural damage at all. And the more effectively that we can start to rationalize with that patient that they're in control of their pain, the perception of danger will reduce and their pain will reduce. Now, research has shown that especially in chronic pain, the most effective um, ways to reduce pain um, are at first novel movements. Now, novel movements is just a general term for a non-painful movement, which is replicating a painful movement. So, for example, uh, a painful movement for a patient with a shoulder injury could be a um, just pressing a weight above the head or lifting the hand above the head. But if we create a closed kinetic chain version of this, a closed kinetic chain is where the hand or the applicator is fixed. It's where, uh, so for example, um, a bicep, uh, sorry, for example, a bench press is an open kinetic chain because the weight in your hand is not fixed. But a press up is a closed kinetic chain because the hand, i.e. the applicator, is fixed. That's a closed kinetic chain. Closed kinetic chains are deemed safe by the nervous system in comparison to an open kinetic chain. So if we start off with closed kinetic chains at first, we can create a much safer environment for that patient to go through full range of motion. Back pain is a good example. For a lot of patients with back pain, it will be painful for them to bend down and touch their toes or slump on the spot. But this is because their spine is loaded and going through flexion or extension. Therefore, if we create a closed kinetic version of this, i.e. put them in a more forced position, and at the same time get them to replicate cat cows, which is a, a, like a, a yoga movement where you're flexing your back and then extending your back in an unloaded position, then they will be less likely to experience pain, but we can re-educate the nervous system that flexion and extension doesn't have to be painful, and then the facilitation or that hypersensitization or the nociceptive response can then start to reduce. And we want to also educate our patients on how to control their pain. By uh, even just in your own mind, in their own mind, doing a pain diary, realizing when pain comes on. For a lot of patients, it will take them maybe like two hours of sitting for the pain to come on, and then they're stuck with it for the rest of the day. So what we do is we educate them that, right, I need you to move every hour to an hour and a half. And from here, after, after, after doing that, I need you to go through your novel movements or your cat cows, reduce the nociceptive bombardment to the, uh, the, the spinal cord, and then from there, they can then start to delay their pain. So once again, they're not being barraged with as much uh, nociceptive stimuli, so their pain starts to reduce. And this means that their pain will reduce overall as well because we're lowering uh, the bombardment of nociceptive stimuli to the spinal cord. So this is the first phase. First phase is home education, pain education, home management. If we can get the patient to control their pain, their pain will reduce. After this, we then need to start to progress even this into consideration, they need to start to progress from what was what is painful now to what is going to be pain free in the future. So let's go back to the example with the patient who unfortunately can't pick up their children anymore. We break down that movement. That movement is going from a standing position to a squat position to a bent forward position and then standing up after that. So how can we break this down? First thing that we can do as well as the um, uh, the novel movements, is getting them used to squatting. The best way to do this would start off with a box squat. A box squat would literally be sitting down, hands out to here, standing up, and then sitting back down again. Repeated, repetitively doing this. We're challenging their hip musculature, we're challenging their core stability somewhat, and it will start to serve as a good uh, exercise to get them used to the movement that we eventually want them to end up in. As well as that, we can combine it with some type of spinal compression. The reason why we want to do this is because under load, or when, uh, when it, even when you have to stabilize your core, your spine will be going through some form of compression because you're getting muscular activation on both sides of the spine, causing compression throughout the spine. And we could do this with some, for example, some standard core activation exercises. We could do it with, if the plank is too uncomfortable to start with, then we can literally just do some core activation with the patient laying um, supine and just getting them to push their back into the into the floor and then take their back away from the floor. And we can repeat this to just get them used to the spinal load. 
compression. After this, we then want to uh, start to get them to control their movements a little bit more effectively. So we're going to be going from a close to a bit more of an open kinetic chain. Therefore, with the um, squats, the box squats, we can go from, you know, we can start to um, incorporate three second eccentric and three centric concentric phases to get that patient used to controlling their core stability under tension with uh, peripheral movement as well. And then after that, we can then start to uh, change that into a free squat or a wall squat. And then from there, we can start to use uh, the goblet squat, for example, so holding a weight in the hand while squatting to start to get them used to that movement. And by doing so, we're desensitizing the nervous system, but at the same time, we're increasing, increasing that patient's confidence, increasing their activity levels, making sure that their strength and uh, their core remains challenged so they're less likely to waste and we should have a better patient outcome. Beam trials have shown that uh, osteopathic or chiropractic manipulation um, in the long term isn't successful unless exercises are also uh, combined with that treatment. So that's my presentation today. Um, we I came up with this system um, as a result of having a few, uh, few, few hours of meetings with my team, with our physios and our osteopaths. Uh, we brainstormed the current evidence coming from uh, Laura Mosley and other pain scientists and as well as that using books like um, uh, Starting Strength and um, yeah, Starting Strength and other strength conditioning books to come up with this program. I hope you find it useful and I hope you find it useful for your CPD submission. My name is Elliot Reed, registration number 8615. Thanks for listening.